It's time for Mewtwo. <laughs> oh yeah, that's why I was gonna say give the Quick Claw to Mewtwo is because uh, if you could proc Quick Claw and then have the Flint. What did I say, Brayden? What did I say? What the fuck? What did I say? I thought that's sturdy. Yup, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation, and so did about four million other people. What did I say, Brayden? What did I say? What the fuck? What did I say? I thought that's sturdy. It was Brayden again. <laughs> We learned not to listen to our friend's advice. I, 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 I do, I, I f can't. I f can't. Oh, but if he had the quick claw, yeah. Yeah, if only he had that quick claw. So after spending a night crying over people being mean on the internet, I had a realization. Wait a minute. These people are all babies. I know more than these kids when it comes to Pokemon. Heck, I bet most of them weren't even alive when this game came out. I decided to put my pride on the line and do a Nuzlocke of my very own in the exact same game where Mewtwo the Onyx once stood. Now, I'm sure that if you're watching this video, you already know the general rules to a Nuzlocke from that video. But I decided to put my Pokemon skills to a tougher test by attempting a hardcore Nuzlocke, which just means that it's all the normal Nuzlocke rules that you know and love with the added challenge that I can't use items in battle and I have to set a level cap for each gym to the same level as the leader's ace. If you want the full rules, just read the description or something, I don't know. And if you're already down there, why don't you hit the subscribe button? So with a goal in sight and a chip on my shoulder, I embarked into the world of Pokemon on to begin my journey. With that out of the way, we're free to go out and explore all that Kanto has to offer. Okay, but not until Professor Oak gives us our first Pokemon. For obvious reasons, I went with Squirtle here. I now have the cap to my kid who immediately proceeds to make quick work of Mario's Bulbasaur, so any fears of exposing myself as a fraud in my first battle post Onyx killing are immediately snuffed out. Now, it was truly time to set off on my adventure through the Kanto region. And I've gotta say, things start started off exceptionally well. Almost too well. Our first encounter was a max level Pidgey that we named Messiah, who also happened to have an attack boosting nature. I had a lot of faith in our Route 1 savior. Route 2, we get another solid encounter in Remy the Rattata, and with Messiah by my side, I feel confident that Mario will be a pushover at this point. He was. Time for the Route 22 encounter, and oh ho ho ho. Could this team get any better? We are going to breeze through this game with our girl power. We welcome... Uh, Harambe to the team, and I don't think I could have asked for a better batch at this point in the run. For the last encounter before Brock's gym, I end up catching Kai the Weedle, and my entourage of girls is ready to swoon Brock out of a gym badge. Until disaster struck. While grinding up Harambe on wild Pokemon, my <coughs> my authentic Nintendo licensed Game Boy froze up on me while fighting a random Rattata. Foolishly, I hadn't saved my game yet, so the run that was looking so promising came to an abrupt end. A team destined to cruise to victory taken away by my own poor decision yet again. To those fallen comrades that will never have their stories told, we will always remember you. So after bawling my eyes out over the best pre-gym one Nuzlocke team I've ever had, it's time to start over. Same old song and dance, so I'll keep the recap brief. Hi Oak. Bye Oak. Pick up No Cap the Squirtle. Destroy Mario 2 in a battle. Catch a level 3 Pidgey. Let your Pidgey die. Wait, Pidgey didn't die in the first run. Needless to say, after having such a successful start to my last run, I was a little bit impatient with trying to get back to the point where we had been, so I had, um... Some very unfortunate losses that wouldn't have happened if I was being careful the same way I was during the first run. Whew. Okay, now let's get back to where we were. Crit the Rattata. God damn! Catch a Rattata. L lose a Rattata. Okay, maybe I am bad at this game. And lastly, catch ourselves a bug. Finally, we made it out alive. With three less Pokemon than the first time, granted. But we are alive and saving this time. Between no cap and bad girl, I'm still confident that I can pull this one out. I just need to be more careful. Now this is where the true run begins. Right before the first gym, no more excuses. That promising team that we once had is now a relic of the past. Luckily, I still have Squirtle as my star 
starter, so Brock is a complete blowover, and I managed to get my first Onyx Slaughter, which I know you're happy to see. With the Boulder Badge in hand, it's time to make our way to Cerulean City and hopefully pick up a few more team members along the way, because as good as Squirtle has been so far, we're going to need some help to cover his weaknesses. Our next encounter ended up being a Spearow that we named after a Chatter. He was no Messiah, but this bird would have to do. Time for our Mount Moon encounter, and we get... A Zubat. I mean, what else did I really expect here? My team keeps getting weaker and weaker to electric types, so not oh. getting a Geodude here was a huge bane to the team's composition. Unfortunately, our journey with Kaibat would not be long lived. Wandering around aimlessly in Mount Moon without a plan ended up in me locking eyes with a random trainer. Meet Super Nerd Joven, who has two electric types. Oh, sh. <laughs> I had no answer for this. Magnemite was the hardest counter to my team at this point. With a Wartortle, Beedrill, Spearow, and Zubat, my run looked doomed to this piece of scrap metal. To get around it, I knew that sacrifices were imminent. No Cap was my only option to hit Magnemite for neutral damage, so which Mon would I have to place on the altar allowing Wartortle in for free? Even though she had just joined us for our journey, Kaibat was the most expendable option, so I sent her to her death. She had served us well though, as this was the free switch that we needed to get in No Cap, who came in with fiery vengeance to secure the kill, and it's still alive. No Cap was the one Pokemon that I needed to protect at all costs, so I couldn't risk hitting myself in confusion and dying. Meaning, I had to say goodbye to one more of our friends. Both of my partners had to give themselves for us to get past this titan named Joven. But in the end, I was able to safely bring out No Cap to finish the job. Our first big moment of adversity overcome with just two members remaining. I beat up some measly Team Rocket grunts, grab the dome fossil, and get out the cave. Leave Leaving behind the remains of our two fallen soldiers who gave their lives so that the run could continue. Being left with an oversized turtle and a small bird, another encounter with electric type and my attempt dies alongside my Pokemon. Enter Mashru. The undisputed people's champ of the run, our Route 4 encounter was truly a godsend. Mashru would be the force to carry us through many of our next toughest roadblocks. But maybe not our very next roadblock. Before I could take on Misty, I had to go through Mario first. With the team still recovering from a near-death experience in Mount Moon, I had to hope that our three team members would be enough to get through our rival and add a couple more key members to the team. No Cap was able to take out Pidgeotto with relative ease, so Mario 2 decided it was a time to throw out the big guns and swap in his Bulbasaur next. Good thing I have a trusty flying type on my team. Oh my god, I accidentally swapped in Matru. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was terrifying. Luckily, I was able to swap in Maton and avert that small catastrophe like the true Pokemon expert that I am. Matt Shrew etches his name in the Captain Kid Nuzlocke lore by getting his first kill and leading us to a crucial victory over Mario 2. Clearing out the trainers on Nugget Bridge allowed Maton 2 to transform from a small bird to a big bird and more importantly, open up two more routes for potential encounters. I had my sights on Bellsprout and with a 25% encounter rate, I got my counter to Misty's gym. Cuphead the Bell Sprout has joined the party and I promise not to ruin the image of Cuphead for any of you ever again. Because of Dupe's Claws, our next encounter was either going to be a Caterpie or an Abra, and you can guess which one we were getting. So Bad Boy replaces our fallen soldier Bad Girl and with my new Fantastic Five, it was time to claim our next gym badge. What about me? Oh yeah, that's right. After doing everything in my power not to kink shame Bill, I trekked back to Celadon City where Misty was waiting for us. I've got to be honest and say, I wasn't worried in the slightest. Cuphead managed to land a sleep powder on the first turn, which allowed him to get absolutely massive. With the additional stat boosts, Cuphead managed to easily win us our second gym badge, and I decided to reward him by letting it evolve. Cuphead has evolved into nature's fleshlight, Weepin' Bell. I guess I'm a pathological liar, and I've now associated Cuphead with something much, much worse.
Matt Shrew had truly opened up the run and was now our brightest star on the team. Before catching him, everything looked bleak and the smell of victory was distant. But now with two gym badges in hand and an electric type gym leader on the horizon, it was time for Matt Shrew's light to shine even brighter. Another star was born when Bad Boy evolved into a Butterfree on the road to Vermilion City. Newly equipped with compound eyes and sleep powder, this bad boy can get us through just about any tough situation. After passing up the opportunity of a lifetime, time to spend $500 to buy some smelly fish off an old man in a hospital, I put my life on the line and hooked up a magic carp of my own. This Pokemon would help set the mood for the rest of the run, and the team was really starting to take some serious form. It's hard to believe that not too long ago, we were struggling to get through one tiny bat-filled cave. Like all good, responsible young parents who aren't ready to have a child in their early 20s, I left my kid with an older adult. See? They always turn out just fine. Before boarding a massive cruise liner with our brand new sea monster, I made sure to give Matt Shrew the little boost he needed to reach his full potential. Now it was time to go board a ship so we could get rid of that pesky roadblock in front of the next gym. Ah, there's nothing like taking in some warm sun rays on a beautiful ship out in the ocean. Mario 2, what are you doing here? Well, this time Matt Shrew won't let your little ratata get away so easily. He's going to bury it into the ground. Oh my God, I didn't think I would actually kill it. After getting a back rub from a 10 year old child, the old sailor gives us HM01 cut and we can finally make our way to Lieutenant Surge's gym. I felt even more confident about this gym than any of the previous two because this is what Matt Shrew was made for. I decided to bring our little Diglett friend along just as a plan B, which may or may not be illegal at the time of this video's posting, but she would not be needed. Despite this Lieutenant's best efforts to induce his own wartime PTSD ghosts on Matt Shrew, he was able to pick out the real Raichu from the imposters and complete the sweep, earning us our third gym badge. All of the doubters were starting to look like fools with how easy I was making this game look. And because of that, it's time for me to introduce to you the special rule that I came up with for this Nuzlocke, the Kid Claws. What's the Kid Claws, you ask? Well, it's quite simple, actually. I have to use Onyx. Yep. That's it. Considering this entire escapade was all started with an Onyx, I felt it was important that I showed the world that not only could I beat a Pokemon Leaf Green Nuzlocke, but I could do it with the Pokemon that everyone thought I knew nothing about. Rock Tunnel is the first location that Onyx became available to me, so I made the long trek back through Cerulean to get to the point where everything would change. Surrounded by the darkness, I looked for my Onyx, and finally, after a little bit of searching, there she was. There was only one name I could choose for our long last that would constantly remind me of the entire reason I was here. I mean, there's gotta be some comedic irony in there somewhere. My team was really starting to take form. I felt that all of these Pokemon, either by necessity or choice, could end up being on the team long term and playing crucial roles in my eventual victory. And since we just arrived in Celadon, the game corner gave me a unique opportunity to pick up a Pokemon I might not otherwise think to use, like Ab Dratini or... Hmm. I left it up to my viewers to decide which Pokemon I should go with, and being the kind fans that they are, they, of course, picked out a Pokemon whose power could rival that of even the strongest legendary in the game. Porygon. They picked Porygon. This was unfortunate for two reasons. Number one, it's a Porygon. Number two, it costs 6,500 coins, meaning I'm going to develop a gambling addiction just to get this one Pokemon. Well, you know what comes next. Cue the slots montage. Actually, I wasn't feeling it at the time, so we'll save Porygon's story for later. I wanted to strengthen my team just a bit before facing Erica's gym, so I traveled through Route 16 to pick up Fly for Maton 2, and in a moment of innocence, I walked up to this seemingly unassuming couple. Oh no, oh! Considering these two were higher levels than my entire team and I had just boxed my water type starter in favor of my HM slave, I was pretty convinced that this could be the end of the run. Thankfully, Mashru and Mood were able to prevent an astronomical disaster from transpiring during what this couple considered a romantic date. With Fly now safely secured, I walked into Erica's gym and let Maton 2 run wild like an out of control weed whacker. 
Oh god, the carnage. We had officially collected half of the gym badges, something that Zink here didn't think was possible. After defeating the grass type gym leader, I thought it would be okay to finally add our four times week to grass rock snake to the party. Unfortunately, that meant that someone would have to be replaced. And taking a close look at our team, there was one Pokemon that seemed to fill the exact same role that Sturdy would. With a heavy heart and a mauling swarm of viewers, I decided it was time to put Matt Shrew in the PC for good where he could live a peaceful life and avoid death's embrace. Now it was time to go see what nefarious activities Team Rocket was up to underneath the game corner, and after making quick work of Giovanni's team with our two water types, we picked up the Sylph Scope and headed back to Lavender Town to visit our rival's dead Raticate. I rescue Mr. Fuji from Team Rocket, and he rewards me with a musical instrument. Do I look like I know how to use this thing? The answer, of course, is no. But I do know how to use these! It finally felt like the proper time to add Porygon into the mix. After all of that hard work, I didn't want to just drop 6,500 coins on Porygon only for its corpse to rust away in the PC. No, 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 no. I wanted to actually use this thing. So I came up with a perfect strategy for it. As you may know, Dark and Steel type were both added to Pokemon in Generation 2. Dark was largely added to counter the overpowered Psychic type Pokemon, and uh, uh oh, there's there's a whole gym with psychic types coming up. With Fire Red and Leaf Green being remakes of Generation 1, however, there are no darker steel types available to be found in pre-post game Kanto. Well, besides this retconned little guy. With no dark type available to catch, there wasn't a single Pokemon completely immune to Sabrina's team. Except one. That's right. Porygon. Now, let me explain. Porygon has a signature move called Conversion, which allows it to transform into one of the types of the various moves that it holds. And luckily for us, Porygon learns exactly one dark type move, Thief. Conveniently, I had a spare copy of the TM, so I fed it to Minecraft and voila, Dark Porygon was born. Now would also be a good time to mention that I had been EV training all of my uh, unique choices. You can look into effort values on your own time if you're unaware, but the TLDR for this type of training is that you beat up a lot of little Pokemon to make certain stats stronger. In the case of our team, we had some Pokemon with stats that certainly left something to be desired. I maxed out Sturdy's attack and speed to make up for those lackluster offensive skills. To make Minecraft as powerful as possible, I wanted to max out its special attack. Meaning that without Surf and access to the power plant, the only way to do this was to search over and over and over again for Abra on routes 24 and 25, and with only a 15% encounter rate, this took hours. Needless to say, I had spent so much time with these two that I would be absolutely devastated if anything would ever happen to them. I am getting a little bit ahead of myself though because there are still some minor, uh, pretty major tasks that I had to take care of before we could even think of stepping foot in Sabrina's gym. My awful music skills were able to throw this Snorlax into a rage, so I swiftly put that to rest by stuffing its big fat belly inside my tiny little ball. We gladly welcome Pablo on board, but this squad already has its token normal type. After sweeping through a gang of bikers with my beautiful butterfly, I made it to Fuchsia City to pick up Surf and and take on Koga. If you couldn't tell, I'm really trying to delay this Sabrina fight for as long as possible. With my current squad, Koga was going to be a pushover. Yep, we swept this team with a butterfly. The only thing left to delay the inevitable now was snuff out Team Rocket's plans at Sylph Co. 11 floors, one Lapras, and a Master Ball later, it was finally time to take on Sabrina's gym. My Porygon strategy would be put to the test. I had done a lot of hypothesizing, but hypotheses are no good without any data to back them up. And as we all know, nothing bad ever happens in Sabrina's gym. The first experiment was an overwhelming success. Porygon was able to immediately turn into a dark type and there was absolutely zero threat of me losing. However, there were some flaws with the strategy. And we can recover and now we sweet. Uh oh. <laughs> now we just spam recover until we're uh, out of that. Okay, there we go. Please stop. Please. This is I, this was uh, unfactored in the situation. What transpired next, however, could not have been predicted by any fortune teller. It's okay, Minecraft. You got this. Destiny Ball! Please hit yourself! Uh oh. Oh no. Our strategy! 
No, Minecraft! You're joking. All of this time and effort meticulously poured into one little Porygon, all torn apart by a gym trainer of all people? With an extremely heavy heart, I had to box my failed science experiment and picked up the Pokemon that the experts are saying is all the rage. However, my crippling depression couldn't keep me away from the gambling addiction I had developed, so back to the slots it was for me. Fortunately, it all worked out in the end as this extra gambling meant I could pick up a Shadow Ball TM to teach to Pablo that would ensure that truly nothing bad ever happens in Sabrina's gym. I see that you're implored a separate strategy than what I preferred of not being drastically under leveled. <laughs> so let's see, let's what see this how does. it pays off. Well, okay, fuck you, buddy. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go. Nothing could ever replace the void in my heart that was left by Minecraft, but breezing through the Sabrina fight with our newfound chonkers certainly helped heal the wounds that had been left. This story would have been very different if it weren't for Channel or Tasha, but there is still much to be etched into the lore of this Nuzlocke, so we didn't have time to dwell on our seizure-inducing science project. Anyways, it was finally time for us to take on the hey, man buddy. whose hair had been scorched off by the Pokemon he uses. And because I don't trust my Pokemon knowledge anymore for some reason, I just decided to value brawn over brains and brute force my way through the gym by melting every gym trainer with my oversized water dragon. With barely a scratch, my team Team and I were now just one gym badge away from the summit of this long journey. Things had been relatively easy up to this point, and it only proceeded to get easier as we headed for the easiest gym leader in all of Kanto. But first, our boy Bill hit us up to run some monotonous errands for him on some random islands, and uh, yeah, we may have killed some massive firebird that was blocking our way or something, but who's keeping track? Finally, we returned to Viridian City, where things had come full circle as our starter was now all grown up and swept his way through yet another gym. So after foiling Giovanni's plans for the last time, there was only one thing left for us to do. Claim our redemption by becoming the champion of the Kanto region, but much more importantly, defeat that jinx. Sizing up the team before embarking on the final leg of the journey made me realize that we might have been lacking in some departments. While half the team was made up of some of the most powerful monsters in the region, the other half was, well, underwhelming to say the least. Without these three, we wouldn't have ever gotten to this point. But to reach our ultimate destination, we had to make a change. So with a heavy heart, I decided that it was best for the team to say bye-bye to Bad Boy the Butterfree. Taking bad boy to the end with me. Bad boy and I are, we're like this. There was only one Pokemon that I would be willing to give up a spot for this late in the run, which just so happens to be one of my favorite Pokemon of all time, Magneton. And since this was the last Pokemon we'd ever catch, uh, there was no need for this thing anymore. Joam joined the party and all the pieces were in place to complete our Nuzlocke puzzle. Mario too tried stopping us in our tracks, but we proved that he still had a lot to learn before taking on the absolute gauntlet of an Elite Four that awaited him past Victory Road. I showed off all my papers and only got violated by one of the guards on my way there, but I finally made it through to the Indigo Plateau. All of our final preparations were made before entering the most terrifying escape room, including deciding who to teach TM26 to, and I know what you're thinking. Wow, that would be a perfect move to give to Gyarados considering its massive attack stat and Onyx. I gave it to my Onyx. Newly equipped with Earthquake and most importantly, a Quick Claw, Sturdy was as powerful as ever, so I was ready to cross through to the point of no return. Typically, when playing a Pokemon game, the final boss comes after you defeat all of the Elite Four members. But my run was special. This run started with our champion. This was it the moment of truth. Lorelei has been a point of ridicule for an entire year, but this is where I changed the course of history. This is the only trainer capable of repairing my legacy. She started off as she always does by throwing out her dugong, which was no worry for me as Joam absolutely melts through this Pokemon. One down, four remain. Next up, Cloyster, even easier than before. Slow bro, more like no bro. <laughs> 
Lapras. Four down, one remain. Backed against the wall, Lorelei finally pulls out her Exodia, the level 54 Jinx. A Pokemon that has cast the darkest shadow over my entire career. There was only one way to finish this. I set the stage with Joan by paralyzing the witch, and then it was time. Time? for Onyx. Time for redemption. With nothing but pent up rage built up over an entire year and thousands of berating comments, the only way to wipe this moment from everyone's collective conscience was to go boom. This was the only way that it could end. Going out with a bang, engulfed in the flames of war, a necessary evil that would end all suffering. An unbearably painful decision, but an unavoidable sacrifice to prove to the world that Onyx does kill Jinx. We all said our final goodbyes and carried on with a promise to not only Sturdy, but Mewtwo as well, that we would become the greatest champion that the Kanto region had ever seen. After the emotional outpouring that was fighting Lorelei, mistakes are prone to happen. Luckily, Bruno gave me an opportunity to do what I do best, kill an Onyx. Then he let Mood get set up with Dragon Dance, uh, only for me to get scared of his very next Pokemon and switch out expecting an attacking move. Uh oh. I ended up reversing the roles and let Machamp set up on us, leaving Maton 2 too weak to deal the finishing blow with Drill Peck and take a devastating cross chop that led to its death. An entirely preventable death is never an easy pill to swallow, but there was no time to mourn as standing before us was a Machamp who just had a killer chest workout. Luckily, No Cap was able to dodge a cross chop and finish off the Machamp with a surf, and the battle ends just how it started with a dead Onyx. With half of the Elite Four down and already a third of the team gone, things could certainly be going better, but the mods that we had left were the cream of the crop, so I really wasn't worried. A giant bear throwing balls of shadows seemed like it would be an easy way to sweep through Agatha's team, but Agatha had other plans for me. No! I quit. <laughs> By some stroke of luck, Pablo managed to find the right Gengar in the Sea of Illusions. Something tells me that our fallen partners might have had something to do with that. The rest of her team was a complete pushover when they weren't spamming double team, and all of a sudden we found ourselves one trainer away from the champion. Any trainer that wields an army of dragon type Pokemon is instantly terrifying, but luckily the plan was in place to steamroll through his team with Ice Beam and Thunderbolt. Unfortunately, a little paralysis made things a bit more difficult than they needed to be, and he's living on 1 HP. This battle is becoming unnecessarily hard, and we don't have any explosion gimmicks left to give us a free kill. Unlike Lance's Aerodactyl, however, I had the foresight to bring Magneton, and our last minute addition was able to deal the final critical blow, and with that, I had made it to the very end. I was one battle away from completing this hardcore Nuzlocke challenge and retaking control over my legacy. This felt inevitable. I had already overcome the true final battle when I took out Jinx, so I just saw Mario 2 the same way that I'd always seen him. An unworthy rival, incapable of laying claim to the throne of this region. Mario 2 shows his immediate lack of preparation by throwing his Pidgeot into my Magneton lusting for blood, so he then tries to hard counter me by throwing in his big scary fire dog. Well, I'll raise you one better and counter with my giant water snake. In hopes that Rhydon can right all of his wrongs to this point in the battle, he goes for a desperate attempt at intimidation, and even that fails. Rhydon falls even easier than the first two. Completely forgetting all of the history we've had throughout this run, he believes that his Venusaur will finally be able to outdo my team, but it is no match for the behemoth that is Pablo. Everything is going exactly as I planned. Just like I said before, this battle seemed inevitable from the start. The challenge was already won when we defeated Jinx. Mario 2 was nothing more than a side character at this point. Unaware of the trauma this Snorlax caused to Sabrina, he tries using using Alakazam as an answer, but we've all seen how this one plays out. Mario 2 makes one final attempt by thrashing about in a state of panic, but there was no stronger counter to his final Pokemon than Joe. So after one last Thunderbolt, the battle was over. I had won. Overcome with a wave of emotion, I placed those four Pokeballs down one last time into the Hall of Fame where they would be legends forever. And as I walked out onto Indigo Plateau for the first time as League Champion, I just knew that I was being watched over as the final chapter in my hardcore Nuzlocke was written.
Finally, it's over. No more Onyx comments. Whoa! What the hell was that? Where did this come from? Is this thing on? Hello? Pokemon challenges? Am I, com am I coming in? Hello? Yeah, it's working, but what What are you doing here? Oh, it's, the, it's, it's you, it's the Onyx guy. I remember you. Thank yeah, you <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good yeah, anyways, I did pretty well, right? No more mean comments? Brayden, that's actually not going to be enough. To escape your legacy of being the worst Nuzlocker, you know what you have to do, right? No, what? what? I, I, I'll i do anything at this point. You have to put your entire fist in your mouth, Brayden. My, my entire fist? Your entire fist. I'm smiling! You know what? That was actually a pretty good try, but I don't think that's going to be enough either. How about you try to beat an Emerald Kaizo Nuzlocke instead, huh? Okay, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, that sounds much better.